All right, welcome back. We're going to finish up talking about uh, how to use morphological characters to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree, and we're going to pick up uh, talking about determining character polarity. Okay, now there are some pitfalls in determining homologies. We have to be very careful when we do this. Um, the first thing is that some of the homologies may be analogies. Sometimes, even with our best efforts, uh, natural selection can create things that look very, very similar to one another. This happens a lot in plants. For example, the same types of leaf, leaf shapes have evolved repeatedly, or similar stem structures have evolved repeatedly. And then, once we have the homologies, that's not enough, because remember, we don't want to work with all homologies. We want to work with synapomorphies, not symplesiomorphies, when we go about uh, using our homologies to reconstruct relationships. So that takes us to our next step, which is once we have figured out what we think are homologies, then we have to figure out character polarities. And we'll explain that in a second. Basically, determining character polarities is determining which things are synapomorphies and which things are symplesiomorphies. Okay. So the key issue here is when we look at a, a set of characters, did A evolve from A prime, in which case A would be the derived character state, or did A prime evolve from A? If A prime evolved from A, then A prime is the derived character state and the synapomorphy, the thing that we want to use to group things together. So there are three different methods for determining character polarity. All right, so the first one is what we call an outgroup comparison. And let me draw what this looks like for you. Suppose we have three species, A, B, and C, and they have some trait that we'll call 1 and 2. And what you want to know is, is 1 the derived version of the trait, or is 2 the derived version of the trait? Well, one way to do that is to get another species that's outside of A, B, and C. We pick D, for example. And then we say, what character state does D have? Maybe D has character state 2. That would mean it's most likely that 2 is the ancestral form. If we were to draw this from an evolutionary point of view, say we have initially A, B, and C. We don't know what their relationships are but we know that D is outside of them, out here. So if D has character state 2, then most likely at the root of A, B, and C, the ancestral version is 2, and the derived state is going to be 1, okay? And so that's how we use outgroup comparison to figure out what the relationship is of different things. Okay? And this is just repeating what we just drew, so you can come back to this and look at it if you would like to. All right. Now, there are some shortcomings to outgroup comparisons. If you pick different outgroups, you could get conflicting information about which character state is ancestral. Um, and the other thing is that before you can do an outgroup comparison, you actually have to know that something is outside of the group that you're working with. So in some sense, you're assuming a certain amount of phylogenetic knowledge uh, beforehand to know that something is outside of the group that you're working with. All right, the second thing that we can do is look uh, at the embryological development for the different characters. And this is referred to as the embryological criterion. The idea behind this came from a guy named Carl Ernst von Bayer, uh, who was actually around before Darwin and, uh, and did not think that evolution occurred, but it turns out that his work became uh, fundamental in uh, using embryological information to figure out the ordering of events. The basic idea here is that as uh, an embryo develops, that the general features occur first, and that these are more ancient uh, in evolutionary time, and that newer developmental features occur later in development itself. Um, if you've ever heard the expression that phylogeny recapitulates, uh, or rather ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that's where this comes from. That the development is actually going through the same steps that happened during evolution as well. And here's an example of this. Um, 
Here we have a lizard, a tortoise, a pig, and a human embryo. And at the earliest stages in development, we can see that they look very similar to one another. They have common features. And then as they develop, they start to get distinguishing features that separate them from each other. And so the common features that they have early on says that they all share a common ancestor as vertebrates, and then later they begin to separate out according to unique features that uh, appear in their development. Okay, now there are shortcomings to this approach as well. Um, it's not always correct, in fact, that the more derived characters appear at a later point in development. Sometimes you get insertion of features um, that are newer in the developmental process. All right, and finally, you can use the fossil record, what we call the paleontological criterion, for determining the order in which things have occurred. Um, so certain characters are recorded in the fossil record, particularly for hard body parts, as we've already talked about. Um, and these can allow us to determine what order of events uh, things occur in. The principle is very straightforward. Things that are earlier in the fossil record are ancestral, and things that are found later in the fossil record are considered derived. Now, even here we can make mistakes, because remember the fossil record is incomplete, and so we can get a misleading view of what is ancestral and derived when we're working in the fossil record. Uh, and here's an example of how this would work. Suppose this is what really happened. You've got speciation events taking place, between different species. And let's say the ancestral character is big A and the derived character is little a. All right, and let's just say that little a arises at this point in time, okay? And so you have big A being carried through in this species over here and little a in this species over here. But let's suppose the fossil record is really incomplete, and what we actually have is the following. So this is what our fossil record looks like, okay? All that other stuff that we drew didn't get fossilized and didn't get recorded. And so what it ends up looking like in time, right, is that the little a character appears to have actually evolved before the big A character in time. And so, because of the incompleteness of the fossil record, we could make a mistake and think that the little a character was ancestral and the big A was derived when it's really the other way around. All right, so we've figured out these character polarities, what are the synapomorphies, and then, remember we talked earlier about how there could be character conflict, and so this is the point at which we bring in parsimony, because there may be some character conflict in spite of our best efforts. So. It's good if we can have multiple lines of evidence that things are a synapomorphy, since we have three different methods for determining that. Um, but sometimes we don't have as good evidence as we would like, and so we have to make a decision. We can go to parsimony and just pick the most parsimonious tree, or we could look at something and say, you know, it really would make more sense to go out, collect some more data before I try to put this tree together. The other thing that we could do is just simply suspend judgment and say, I don't have enough information. I'm going to have to go ahead and get another grant. Uh, but for the time being, I'm not going to say anything about what the relationship of these organisms are. All right. So once we do this, and we've already gone through this, so I'm not going to go through any detail here because we talked about it earlier. But once we go through this process, we then reconstruct the phylogeny according to whichever one of the unrooted trees has the least number of steps in it. And once we've done that, we may have to go back and reassign what we think about traits. So we may end up saying, ah, well, we thought this trait here was uh, 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 a homology, but no, in fact, it's really uh, an analogy. Or we may go back and say, oh, we thought this was the derived version of this trait, but based on the best tree, it's actually not. It's, a, uh, it's an ancestral trait. And so these things get assigned after the fact. Okay, and then finally what we'll do is we'll root the tree.